The question is, is quote unquote crying it out for a child close to two years old completely wrong if sleep habits are getting worse and worse? What about a baby and letting them cry so they will learn to sleep through the night? So before I dive in here, I just want to point out two assumptions, at least that I had when I raised this question 30 years ago. Um, the first question that, that, that's implicit here is that uh, if, if, if everything is going right, then a child's sleep habits in a linear fashion improve. So if the child's sleep habits are not in a linear fashion improving, then there's something wrong which is going to require uh, a unique uh, and perhaps extreme response of cry it out. Uh, in this case, the sleep habits are getting worse and worse, then maybe we have to resort to something like crying it out. Okay, that's, that's implicit question number one. Implicit question number two is that, uh, isn't it true that babies need to be taught to sleep through the night? And if you don't actually send them to school for this, if you don't give them lessons in sleeping at night, then they won't sleep through the night. Isn't that true? So we're going to try to address those two questions. But first, uh, as my style usually is, I want to zoom all the way out. In 1985, uh, this, this whole topic became a topic. Before 1985, no one had ever heard of sleep training. Before 1985, no one had ever recommended before, just let the kids scream it out. In 1985, there was uh, an academic who came out with... Uh, a book, a popular book. The book was How to Solve Your Child's Sleep Problems. It was by Dr. Ferber, and he hit on uh, an acute need in, in our culture. The acute need actually had very little to do with our child's sleep problems. The acute need had to do with our sleep problems. Our kids, our young kids, our babies were keeping us up at night. So, Historically, couples had all sorts of different ways of dealing with that. Very often, the man had to get up the next morning for work. He just, there was no way he was going to be functional at work the next day unless he slept. Uh, mom was home taking care of the kids. She could perhaps sleep in with the kids in, 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 in the morning a little bit later. Uh, or she was just uh, heroically torturing herself in order to take care of all the children. And so she would be up at night with the kids. And this whole issue of solving our child's sleep problems never really occurred to anybody. We all just coped. However, uh, by this point, most American mothers were working full time. And, uh, and Ferber's advice about how to solve your child's sleep problems, which is really how you could get a good night's sleep, uh, was something that was like water for a thirsty man. It was, it was exactly what we all needed to hear. And he came up with a solution based on research he had done. Now, his research was actually not about, um, specifically about getting children to sleep through the night. His research was on something called learned or induced helplessness. And uh, it's a well-known field. The idea behind learned or induced helplessness is that if somebody is distressed and they cry out and salvation doesn't come when they cry out. They keep crying and crying and crying and, and the salvation never comes. At a certain point, the person goes into a psychological state of despair. And from that point forward, the person will no longer cry out. They're not at peace. They're being tortured. But they intuitively, they, they viscerally sense that there's no point in crying out and therefore the urge to cry out actually goes away. Uh, again, the, the, the person is still... Uh, agonizing, but crying out is not the response. Um, you see this in all sorts of, uh, you know, different experiences people have in life. Um, uh, one experience which is common is, not or not so common, but it's, it's common area for this area of research is when someone is literally being tortured. If somebody is tortured and uh, while being tortured, they cry out and the crying out never brings relief then they stop crying out. It's not because they're not being tortured. It's not because the torture is not releasing enormous amounts of cortisol in their body. It's not because they're not stressed over this. Uh, but the, the body learns that if crying out doesn't help, then it stops crying out. So Ferber was an expert in induced 
slash learned helplessness and realized this could be the salvation for millions of American parents who are being tortured by their children at night. If the parents would just stop responding, then the kids would give up and stop crying. That doesn't mean that the cortisol levels in the child's body would drop, which has, uh, if the cortisol levels are high, it has very, very significant uh, implications for the child's brain development because cortisol tends to unhook the, the uh, microscopic uh, neural connections that a child needs to make when they're young. So there, there was going to be brain damage, but no one really knew it at the time when he published his book in 1985. However, by 2005, people knew, and people were mad, and Ferber was in big trouble. So as an example of, of his recognition of how much trouble he was in, uh, the Chicago Tribune approached him because in 2005, he edited his book. He revised it and said, I never meant the kids should just cry it out, which is what he had initially written. Just let them scream and scream and scream until eventually they stop screaming. And then you'll be able to sleep at night. And he said, I never meant that, even though that's what it said in the book. And he rewrote the book and re-released it in 2005 in a new, in a new edition. And the Chicago Tribune covered the rewrite with the headline, Cry It Out Baby Doctor Has Altered His Advice. I just want to read to you a little bit from the Chicago Tribune. They write as follows, Ferber is combating what he says are misconceptions about his method, which he says may not be appropriate for all children, although he's a little difficult to pin down. On network TV morning shows last month, he said he hasn't radically changed his cry it out advice, but a revised edition of his book due out in several months does explore additional techniques for helping children sleep through the night. The hubbub has refocused attention on one of modern parenting's most vexing issues, how to get your child to sleep through the night, which of course I'm editorializing and pointing out that young children don't do. Diane, Diane Sawyer on Good Morning America pointed out to Ferber that his book did recommend leaving a child crying for up to 45 minutes. Now he says he's been misunderstood and that some crying is okay, but that's too much. If it means a little crying to learn a habit so that now they don't have to cry repeatedly at night, that's what we're talking about, Ferber told Sawyer. He still favors leaving children in their cribs and periodically soothing them only if necessary. He contends he is revising the book because research has shown that babies don't need as much sleep as he originally advised. He did not return numerous calls for this article and his publicist said he wasn't available to talk about the book. Ferber's work became the rage in the 1980s, a Bible for many pediatricians. Millions of parents were told to let their babies cry for increasing periods of time each night for about a week. Parents could briefly pat or stroke their children and comfort them verbally, but not pick them up. Some parents, however, took the advice to mean that children should simply be allowed to cry all night without intervention until they learned, quote unquote, to go to sleep on their own. The book spawned a cottage industry of baby instruction tombs and a heated debate over whether the crying was right or perhaps harmful. Some studies say letting babies cry can cause learning difficulties for them and anxiety problems for parents. The most ardent and vocal opponent of the cried out method, Dr. William Sears, has just come out with, quote, the baby sleep book, written with one of his two pediatrician sons, Dr. Robert Sears, in which they urge parents to rescue their infants from crying jags. After Ferber's recent TV appearances, the Sears team put out a statement on their website, drsears.com, repeating their advice for parents to go quickly to the rescue of crying kids. They say, a raft of studies strongly suggest that the crying out method can cause long-term damage to children. The studies contend, one, babies left alone experience panic and anxiety, filling their bodies and brains with adrenaline and cortisol stress hormones, which can harm developing brain tissue. Two, infants routinely separated from parents in a stressful way may have lower growth hormone levels that inhibit development of nerve tissue in the brain and suppress growth. Three, intense stress early in life can alter the brain's neurotransmitter systems and cause changes in the brain similar to those seen in adults with depression. Four, infants who routinely have crying episodes may be 10 times more likely to have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and develop antisocial disorders. So Ferber was in big trouble and further tried to, to back motion on this and tried to take, take his original extreme position back and get parents to uh, attend a bit more to their children. In 2014, Psychology Today printed the following warning. Please realize, quote, 
all of the infant sleep science upon which behavior modification based advice is biased towards effective intervention. Effectiveness is based on whether the baby stops crying. Two, sleep training studies are not based on what sleep behaviors are common or developmentally normal. The fallacy is that infant sleep variability, which is normal, is defined as abnormal. So we need an effective intervention to stop an abnormal problem, which is children crying at night. Okay, that was the whole approach of Ferber and some of the concerns that people had at that time. Okay, so that's the end of the, the external literature I wanna quote. Now I do wanna quote one more piece of literature uh, and this one I admit I have a bias towards. I wanna to quote my book, To Kindle a Soul, speaking about nighttime care. Now to truly appreciate what I wrote there, you really have to see this in context because nighttime care is just one part of loving children. And if we wanna give our children proper attention and affection, one of the most special times to provide that, one of the most crucial times, is when the child is most emotionally vulnerable, which is at night. But within that context, I wrote the following. Quote, although our children always need our sensitive responses, they especially need them at night. The combination of drowsiness and darkness makes children feel especially vulnerable then. We have to make special efforts to be attentive to nighttime distress. The effect of ignoring children's nighttime cries was tragically illustrated during the only modern cultural experiment in which children were voluntarily secluded from their parents during sleeping hours. Beginning in the 1930s, Parents living on Israel's secular kibbutzim elected to sleep their children away from home in communal children's facilities. The small staff size at these facilities made it impossible to attend properly to every cry. But the early pioneers of the kibbutz movement hoped that their children would adjust to the less sensitive arrangement. The ill-fated trial produced horrendous results. A barrage of studies found that the graduates of kibbutz children's facilities suffered disproportionately from a range of psychological disorders, including attachment deprivation traumas, major depression, schizophrenia, low self-esteem, and alcohol and drug problems. By 1994, more than half of all children on Israeli kibbutzim exhibited symptoms and psychopathologies associated with insecure attachment. Professor Carlo Schengel, an investigator from Leiden University in the Netherlands, echoed the findings of many earlier researchers when he identified the cause of the psychological disintegration kibbutz children experienced. Quote, although collective sleeping may allow for sufficient monitoring of children's safety, it leaves children with only a precarious and limited sense of security. End quote. As data poured, as data poured in revealing the damage that had been done by children's sleeping facilities, Kibbutz leaders abandoned the experiment. The last of the kibbutzim's 260 children's facilities was finally closed in 1998. Professor Ori Ora Aviezer, the director of the Laboratory for the Study of Child Development at the University of Haifa, summarized the disaster. And she said, quote, Research results indicate that collective sleeping arrangements for children negatively affect socio-emotional development in the direction of a more anxious and restrained personality. Collective sleeping was abolished as it became clear that it did not serve the emotional needs of most kibbutz members. Its disappearance demonstrates the limits of adaptability of parents and children to inappropriate childcare arrangements. Frighteningly, some children in the West are being exposed to just such inappropriate childcare arrangements today in their own homes. The Cry It Out Sleep Training Program offers parents an effective alternative to the hassles of nighttime childcare. Behavioral psychologists behind the plan have demonstrated that infants whose nighttime cries are not answered really do stop crying within as little as three days. Although the program has been touted as a new revolutionary method for teaching children to sleep through the night, it constitutes no more than a revival of the disastrous kibbutz experiment and what it really teaches children is despair. People are attracted to the cry it out method for the same reason they're attracted to many other destructive child raising techniques. It offers a quick behavioral fix. However, intelligent educators take into account the long-term effects of every child raising strategy. Ignoring a child's nighttime cries might eventually produce quiet but it does not cultivate security. 
Thus, children trained with the cried out method were found to wake more often throughout the night, sleep less efficiently, and walk around with more daytime tiredness than children attended to by their parents. Moreover, children deprived of nighttime comfort are at risk for all the psychopathologies discovered among children who slept in kibbutz children's homes. So what do we do? Training children to sleep through the night in a healthy and safe fashion requires distinguishing between five different types of cries. The first type of cry is occasional nighttime whimpers, and they can be ignored. All normal infants make such noises during the night and do not necessarily need attention. This is a child who in the middle of the night goes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then goes back to sleep. Two, tantrums can also be ignored. These cries sound more angry than distressed. And a parent who spends time with their child will know exactly what anger sounds like. Three, if a child cries loudly because he's afraid or lonely, then patting, massaging, or just lightly shaking his crib is usually sufficient to ease him back to sleep. Four, if a child cries hysterically out of distress, he needs to be picked up and held for a period until he feels more calm, at which point he can be nursed, patted, or massaged back to sleep. And finally, five, if the child is hungry, he needs to be nursed back to sleep. If he's wet, he needs to be changed and then nursed patted or massaged back to sleep. If he has a fever, he needs to be given Tylenol. A child might need to consistently experience this sort of attentive nighttime care for many months in order to become secure enough to sleep through the night. Admittedly, an attentive approach requires more parental energy than modern reincarnations of the kibbutz system, but it also promises a more psychologically healthy child. That's the end of the quote from To Kindle a Soul. Now, for more understanding, for the context, go and look at the book. But the bottom line is, we're dealing with a strategy, when we're talking about the cried out strategy, a strategy that could cause real damage. Damage to the brain, damage to emotional systems, damage to intellectual development, serious damage. A couple more observations. Upper and lower canines come in at around 16 to 20 months. That is the canine, the canine teeth. First molars come in between 11 and 18 months, and second molars between 20 and 30 months. Now, when do I get the largest number of complaints from parents about their kids not sleeping through the night? Somewhere between 11 and 30 months. So, one of the reasons is that many of these kids, not all of them, but many of them, are crying at night because they have teeth coming in, and it's agonizing. And you have a child who's in enormous pain and doesn't understand why he's in pain. And it's tooth pain, which hurts so much. And the only comfort he's got are his parents. And his parents are telling him, handle it on your own. Now imagine if your spouse was experiencing excruciating pain and cried out to you. And your response was that you walked out of the room so they could learn to deal with it on their own. Imagine what that would do to your spouse and the relationship. And your spouse is old enough to understand that you're trying to train them to handle this on their own. The children don't know that. These kids have to be viewed as kids who are under extraordinary stress. And if they're in tremendous pain, it's not a time to force them to cry it out. By the way, sometimes a child is just frightened. And that's also not a time to force somebody to cry it out alone. Being alone when you're afraid is a horrific experience, scarring. It's not something that we would ever do to an adult not unless we were trying to torture them. If we were trying to torture somebody, then we would, we would try to scare them and put them in solitary at the same time. But if, if we're not trying to, to, to destroy somebody, to have them disintegrate in front of us, then when a person is terribly afraid, we go and we comfort them. So to summarize, the experiments in Eastern Europe with children in the, in the orphanages there that were left to cry it out, the the terrible experiment that was imposed willingly on the Israeli children, these ended in total disaster. In the early years of Ferber's approach, there was disaster. And what my parents did and what my grandparents did and what all of your grandparents and great-grandparents did to train their children to sleep was they just made the kids very secure by coming to them at night, by comforting them. Sometimes they would have them sleep in the same bed give them a pat and then roll over and go back to sleep again. Today, where people are concerned about perhaps rolling over on a child, you can always have co-sleeping where there's a, a, a little bed that's connected to your bed, but not one that you can roll into. 
and that protects the child from you rolling over on them. There's many different solutions, but, but crying it out is not a great approach. Now, that doesn't mean, as I hinted to in, in my book where I gave five different types of cries and five different types of responses that are appropriate, it doesn't mean that every single time a child cries, you should pick them up. That's gonna destroy their sleep. There is a woman who was a student of Dr. Sears who wrote a very interesting book. Her name is Elizabeth Pantley. And she wrote a very interesting book called The No Cry Sleep Solution. And this book was really written for people who, they, they weren't as comfortable with their kids as my parents and my grandparents. Um, they didn't feel je comfortable just, you know, cuddling with them and helping them make it through the night. They wanted some sort of sleep training program, but they recognized that Ferber's approach was destructive. So Elizabeth Pantley came up with a sleep training program, which is non-harsh. And if you feel the need to sleep train your kids, which again, I don't think it's necessarily something that has to be done. Kids for thousands of years figured out how to sleep at night, but at least until they were teenagers. But if you want a sleep training program that will do far, far less damage, you could take a look at Elizabeth Pantley's book, The No Cry Sleep Solution. So I'm recommending probably not to look at Ferber's book. Uh, you could look at The Kindle of Soul. Uh, that's my book. And you could look at Elizabeth Pantley's book. That, was prob that would probably be my my approach to this issue. I hope, I hope that helps. I hope you enjoyed this. You can access many more hours of free eye-opening content from Rabbi Kellerman at lawrencekellerman.com.